<laughs> okay, well, it's a, it's a real pleasure welcoming Saga Hammonds today here in uh, Louvain de Neuf. So for those who uh, may not know Saga, Saga is a historian of chemistry, specializing in 19th century chemistry, I would say mostly. She recently finished her PhD in the Laboratoire Sphere in Paris under the supervision of Jean Pierre Loret. And <laughs> the thesis was on the discovery of the elements uh, from Lavoisier to Mendeleev, was that the, the time period? And of course, Lavoisier, with his operational definition of the element as the endpoint of chemical analysis, really helped the field of chemistry and the discovery of the elements. But at the same time, the instrumental means at that time were not always uh, sufficient to really reach this endpoint of chemical analysis, yet chemists were somehow convinced they discovered elements, and so you looked into the different kinds of argumentation chemists used for the existence of chemical elements, even though they were maybe able to prove it um, as a simple substance. And um, analogy, I think, played a very important role in a lot of these arguments by 19th century chemists, and I think this is becoming some kind of a red thread in your research, you know, the role of analogy. And so today's talk will be on the role of chemical analogy uh, with respect to the case of ammonia. <coughs> so the floor is yours. You have one hour, short break, and then we'll have one hour of q &A. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you also for coming, all of you. Uh, I'm very happy to meet you and to be here. Um, and to discuss, so indeed this is a case study um, which I did during my, as part of my PhD, but it's the one chapter that's still sort of unfinished, where I'm thinking there's still a lot um, actually to, to add and to sort of rethink, um, because it's quite a complex case. So um, my next project is all also, my new project at the Technical University um, is also about ammonium, and um, yeah thinking about the, the role of analogy um, in this case. So, um, for most of you, I'm assuming that ammon the idea of ammonium being a metal uh, probably sounds uh, quite new. So I thought I would start with um, explaining what I mean by that. Um, so, um, I want to start with, so I also open with this in my, in my abstract, there's this very curious, surprising um, experiment from um, 1808 when the Swedish chemist um, Jan Seiko Berzelius and his colleague um, Magnus Martin Pontin um, found that they were able to produce an amalgam from ammonia uh, with mercury. So that's a metallic alloy. Here you can see an image on the side of um, a very recent uh, reproduction, kind of using a different experimental method, but we can assume that it may have looked something um, like this. So as you can already see, it looks very metallic and it kind of is a metallic um, alloy of mercury and um, what then later would be called um, ammonia. So um, as Berzelius and Pontan also, also said, um, they described it uh, as a miracle. So we saw the known constituents of ammonia meet at the negative pole, so of the, the battery, they used electricity to produce this um, amalgam, and form a metallic body. Um, and in affirming that a metal was composed under our eyes from a fluid of which the constituents are perfectly known to us, we relate a miracle. So they really describe this sense of just being completely astounded that they, they were dealing with a gas, ammonia, um, which was already known by them to be composed of nitrogen and hydrogen, um, which during this reaction seemed to transform into a metallic um, substance. So that's of course completely surprising because only metals form these kinds of compounds. They communicated this um, to Humphrey Davy in England, um, who had reproduced the experiment, had the same um, reaction and concluded that it is scarcely possible to conceive that a substance which forms with mercury so perfect in amalgam should not be metallic in its own nature. So what that means is um, ammonia has to contain a metal, even though we think it might be this gas composed of nitrogen and hydrogen, actually there just has to be a metal in there because it's, it's not possible to, to imagine that it would have this kind of um, reaction otherwise. Um, so how should this, met this metal be called? Um, ammonium, in analogy also to potassium, uh, magnesium, 
calcium, etc. So meaning kind of the metal from ammonia. Um, Berzelius then again was completely uh, convinced by this idea, so much so um, that he included ammonium in this 1811 uh, classification of chemical elements where you can see it all the way at the bottom right, um, ammonium, and then the 14 that's in uh, parentheses there refers to a footnote where he said that under the conviction that chemists will sooner or later agree with me, I have placed ammonium among the metals. <laughs> so he was really, um, you know, aware that it was still a kind of controversial um, idea, but pretty sure that sooner or later everyone would be convinced uh, of, of the existence um, of this metal. So um, despite all of this, um, and despite these two people being really uh, more or less the most famous chemists uh, that were alive during that time uh, in Europe. Um, this, this history of ammonium um, is actually not so well known. And the reason is, of course, as I mean, I assume that most of you um, realize, is that nowadays we don't recognize a metal called ammonium, or we don't, this is not seen as a metallic uh, substance, and especially not a metallic element. Um, and so it has been mostly. Um, yeah, kind of ignored, either ignored by historians or if they do mention it, then it's usually mentioned as a failure, a mistake, or some kind of weird sidetracking of chemical research around that time where they, yeah, they were going the wrong way and then eventually ended up, thankfully, finding um, the right answer. So it's usually seen as something that's not super interesting um, to research because it's not like an exciting uh, discovery, basically. Um, nevertheless, so I think that it's exactly because it's such a complicated and strange and kind of contradictory case um, that it, th th that's what makes it really interesting. Um, so, yeah, that's why I said, why should we care? And also, why should we care at a philosophy uh, seminar? Ju not just for the history of, you know, the fact that these people were actually really working really hard on this question. Um, is that I think that these kind of complex cases um, can tell us a lot more about scientific practice because um, practitioners, and so in this case chemists, um, have to be more explicit about why they think something when there are different um, kinds of evidence um, contradicting each other or when they have to convince other people that don't agree with them. Um, so a lot of things that are kind of implicitly assumed when everyone agrees um, a lot of um, things remain implicit, but when the controversy arises is when um, they have to really justify these kinds of arguments of why do we actually think um, that this metal might exist. Uh, and secondly, um, specifically in this case, um, analogical reasoning uh, played a really big uh, role. So I think it's also an interesting case as an example of what the use of analogical reasoning might look like, specifically in chemistry in the early 19th century, but maybe also uh, more generally. Um, and the reason why um, analogical reasoning was so um, central here is because there was kind of this direct access to a metallic substance that would be ammonium was impossible. So it remained impossible to isolate this metal, um, and the only way to sort of access its composition was indirectly through um, analogical um, reasoning, but I'll say more about this later. Um, yeah, so um, using this as a kind of integrated history and philosophy of uh, science and of chemistry, in this case, uh, case study, um, I want to use this to argue that um, analogical reasoning could um, function as a guide in the establishment of, of, of chemical knowledge and kind of helping chemists dealing um, with this kind of uncertainty when there was a lot of contradiction happening. Um, yes, so <laughs> that's what I just said. It's a case study for use and logical reasoning in identifying chemical composition. Um, so the outline, basically, the, I will um, have two main parts. Um, the second part will be more um, detailed about the story of ammonium um, between the first two decades of the 19th century, but I'll mostly focus on these years 1807 to 1813 because that's when really the metallic ammonium uh, was um, pursued as a, as a pos possible hypothesis. Um, but before then, I will 
um, explain a little bit more um, about chemical analogy and its link uh, to chemical composition in the 19th century. Um, yes. So, um, depending on what type of topics um, you all work on, you might be asking yourself um, different kinds of questions. Um, specifically, I think for the people working on the concept of chemical elements or uh, questions related uh, to that, or who have been reading uh, about this already, um, might possibly be a little bit surprised um, that yeah, these very famous chemists um, would think that it was possible that metallic ammonium existed, um, because it's relatively well known that the, the general definition of chemical element uh, um, around this time was um, that of an indecomposable chemical substance. Um, so I first want to reflect a little bit on this uh, point of what chemical elements um, were around this time, how they were viewed, um, and yeah, what the relation uh, to an energy there uh, was. And yeah, I'll show that actually chemists quite regularly relied on this type of analogical reasoning in their identification of chemical elements. So, Peter already um, referred to this a little bit, um, but let me just explain a little bit more. <laughs> um, so chemical elements, um, right after um, the uh, the chemical, so what, you, what is usually called the chemical revolution, so in the late um, 18th century, um, this, the view of what chemical elements uh, were uh, changed and um, the most accepted definition around this time, so from the late 18th, most, almost all the way to uh, the end of the 19th century, um, was based on the definition formulated by Lavoisier, who said that we must admit as elements all the substances into which we are capable by any means to reduce bodies by decomposition. Not that we are entitled to affirm that these substances we consider as simple may not be compounded, but we ought never to suppose them compounded until experiment and observation has proven them to be so. So what that means is any substance that cannot be decomposed by experimental means should be seen as a simple substance or chemical element, even if it's possible that those substances might be decomposed in the future, there's no way of knowing that they're truly simple. Uh, uh, because yeah, there's just there's no way of knowing until one day we uh, actually decompose them. Um, even with all that uncertainty, um, the best thing is just to stick purely to experimental uh, operations and to never speculate about what their internal nature might actually be. So the idea of um, you know adding uh, something like ammonium to a list of uh, elements, even though it has never been isolated, completely goes against this definition. Uh, so indeed, in that sense, it's relatively um, surprising. Um, but the reason um, why it's less surprising than it may seem is that in practice, actually, views of um, chemical elements were much more complicated than this. So this is um, exemplified, actually, in uh, a, the definition of chemical elements that is listed in Berzelius's own textbook, so the, the same uh, chemist who also put ammonium on the list, who added a third category. So he had simple bodies or chemical elements, compound bodies, any body that's composed of multiple elements that we that is known uh, to be decomposed and recomposed, etc. And there was a third category called undecompounded bodies. So he said we call undecompounded those bodies which we have valid reasons not to regard as simple, but which we have not yet been able to decompose into simpler elements, and whose constituent parts, in case these bodies were composed, are still completely unknown to us. So these are the substances that are actually indecomposable, and yet still are not seen as chemical elements. So chemists were completely aware of this issue that there might be multiple reasons why a substance cannot be decomposed. Um, and very often it might just be due to the fact that the means of decomposition are not strong enough. Um, and so they had this, so in Berzelius's case, it's quite explicit uh, listed at the beginning of his textbook, but many other chemists were also dealing with this idea of undecompounded bodies um, that were actually, yeah, these bodies that were indecomposable, but for different reasons. 
Um, and the role of chemical analogy um, here was kind of straightforwardly to um, distinguish between which are the bodies that are actually simple or probably simple and which are the ones that are decomposable yet still composed um, and what might they be composed of. So what do I mean by chemical an analogy? Um, chemical analogy, so it's a, it's a term that uh, was used by the chemists themselves at this time. Um, by it, I mean a set of relevant similarities in, in chemical properties. So similarly to how an analogy um, doesn't really work if it's just similarities, the similarities that form the basis for an analogical argument have to be relevant. Um, so in this case, this often um, most came down to um, similarities in chemical behavior. So if two bodies react in the same way with another set of bodies, uh, they might be seen as chemical, chemically analogous. So, um, for example, um, we might say chlorine and iodine are analogous because they form acids with hydrogen in a similar way. Um, they react in a similar way with potassium and sodium to produce similar kinds of salts, etc. So this, this is what I mean by similarities in chemical behavior. Um, and these similarities are relevant enough to say that Chlorine and iodine are the same kind of substance. They're chemically analogous. Um, they are both halogens. Um, and that means also that um, chemical analogy was primarily a principle, or at least very, very strongly linked um, to chemical classification. Um, when there were these relevant similarities, it meant that uh, substances could be placed in the same um, kind or the same class. Um, and yeah, uh, that also sort of, there, there was a whole debate about which um, similarities were relevant enough to determine whether or not substances could fit into a class um, together, but there was at least uh, this, this really um, close link between a classification um, and chemical analogy. Um, both classification and analogy also had a strong link to composition, so I would say that chemical classifications were actually based on composition and analogy, so different levels of composition, uh, around this time at least. Within each level of composition, so simple, composed, and then more complex, um, bodies were classified according to these um, similarities in chemical um, properties. There was also the idea that um, analogous bodies generally had the same composition. So analogy in properties uh, is, was kind of like an indicator for the fact that they would have the same composition. Um, this was at first just a kind of a, a general observation. Um, it just happened to be that most often these bodies were composed in the same way, but it also was a kind of rule almost, or um, yeah, a guide as I, as I will argue later. Um, that, so, for example, uh, for already for Lavoisier, so in the late 18th century, the observation that um, a few kind of the most paradigmatic uh, acids all contain oxygen was reason enough to say, well, probably all acids contain oxygen, and that's just a property of the, the group of acids is that they are composed of oxygen. Um, and this kind of reasoning was very um, normal, happening all the time um, during uh, in chemistry around. Um, 1800, and this this idea, this link, this, this yeah, the idea that similar bodies contain similar uh, elements could be used in the study of chemical composition and and helped uh, helped identify what the composition was. Um, so what did that look like? Like I said, um, analogy could be used to distinguish between simple and merely undecompounded um, substances. So this meant that um, on the one hand. Once a new indecomposable substance was produced, um, chemical analogy could be used to establish the plausibility of its simplicity. So, um, in other words, that, that means <laughs> that um, if a new sim simple substance or indecomposable substance was produced and it was analogous to other substances that were already known to be simple, then it was very plausible to say, well, this is probably also a simple substance. Um, or at least, you know, even if um, that doesn't mean that it might be absolutely 
simple because that's that's impossible to prove that it might not be decomposed in the future. At least it will be as simple as all the other simple substances because it fits into a kind of a classification that makes sense. Um, this is what happened, for example, in the case of um, sodium and potassium when Davy um, first isolated these new substances, he really insisted very heavily on um, their analogy to the metals. Um, so they had some strange kind of new properties, such as the fact that they were very light, um, but Davy really insisted, no, 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 they have to be simple substances because they have all these other metallic properties, um, which means that they are similar enough to the metals to be classified as such, and therefore, if they're metals, then they're simple. Uh, on the other hand, there are other examples of substances that uh, didn't have such analogies and that therefore were really problematic. So chlorine is a quite a famous example um, where there was this probably indecomposable simple substance, chlorine, but it didn't fit into any classification of simple substances. It was different um, from um, all other simple substances and it was contested for, um, for a, a while, like six years more or less, it depended on, on individuals, but um, there, was, there was a whole debate and most chemists were actually first opposed to this new element uh, because it just didn't fit into classifications with analogous um, other simple substances. That changed when iodine was uh, discovered and it was just so clearly analogous to chlorine that you had this new family of simple substances that could then be sort of coherently um, accommodated. So you have the possibility of simplicity, but on the other hand, um, if a substance was analogous to substances that, to other substances that were known to be um, compounds, this meant that it was probably um, one of those undecompounded substances. So yeah, chlorine was seen like that for a while, um, but there was a there was a whole list um, actually. So. Um, Thomas Thompson is a, a chemist from that time who had the most explicit list of undecompounded substances where he said, so this is my list of simple substances and then there are about 10 or so more that are technically also decomposable but they don't fit into any of the simple substances and actually they're a lot more analogous to some of the compounds so I'm going to place them with the compounds um, in the expectation that they will be decomposed, basically in anticipation of what will happen um, later. And I will come back to some of those um, examples later. So that's, that, that was a reason to say, okay, probably in this case, the, the fact that we're unable to decompose these bodies is probably due to some other, um, some other issue that's not related to the fact, to their simplicity, let's say. Um, Yes, so that's on the distinction between simple and undecompounded, but then once a body was identified as undecompounded, um, then it could also, an analogy could also be used to predict what it might be uh, composed of. So an example of that is um, alumina, which is one of the um, earths, uh, as they were called um, in the early 19th century. So alumina was very similar to um, the alkalis and the alkaline earth, so potash, um, soda, magnesia, uh, lime, all these other substances that were uh, decomposed by Humphrey Davy between 1806 and 1808 and shown all to be metallic oxides. He then predicted, well, the earths are so similar to all these newly found metallic oxides that they are probably also metallic oxides, uh, but was unable to actually confirm this um, by decomposing them. What he then said was, actually, this similarity in itself is justification enough to take alumina and the other ones uh, as undecompounded and to predict that they will also contain new metals. And so on the basis of this um, analogical inference, he, he also predicted that alumina would contain a metal that he names aluminium. It took almost 20 years from that um, prediction onwards um, before it was actually isolated, aluminium as a metal. Um, but despite that fact, it was also um, already accepted almost immediately. So as if we look back at Berzelius's classification, you also see aluminium there right between beryllium and magnesium uh, listed as one of the elements. And you also notice that um, on the contrary to um, ammonium, 
al aluminium doesn't even have a footnote after it because it was just already so consensual. Everyone was listing aluminium as an element already because, you know, this analogical inference just made sense. <laughs> um, yes. Um, the, the reason um, why, I kind of already anticipated this, but the, re the reason why it just made, made sense to um, believe these predictions was not really because analogical arguments in themselves are so perfectly logically justified. It was more of a pragmatic justification of it, in kind of common sense reasoning, it, it makes more sense to just take a whole family, move it to uh, the group of compounds, rather than to set, make this really sort of artificial separation between different substances in the same group just because you can decompose them um, or not. Um, and like I said, the substance might be indecomposable for a variety of reasons, so chemical analogy helps identify the most likely explanation. So now um, I've hopefully uh, explained a bit more clearly what I mean by this link between analogy uh, and composition. Um, so just to recap, um, the, most, the most important idea is that um, chemical analogy, so by which I mean relevant similarities in chemical properties, was taken to be correlated with chemical composition. Similar bodies have similar composition, and this idea could be the basis um, for analogical inferences regarding substances composition. Um, so, distinguish between simple and decompounded, but also predict the composition of undecompounded bodies. So, now it's hopefully also clear that in itself it was not so exceptional to assume that there would be a metal called ammonia. Um, at least initially, um, to make this inference was kind of normal, <laughs> um, but there is a sense in which um, this case does stand, up, stand out from the other ones, uh, which is that ammonia was not an undecomposed body because it had already been decomposed, and um, they knew already that it was that it, the decomposition produced only nitrogen and hydrogen, so there was no metal there, um, and that's what makes this case um, so complex. And also for chemists at the time, like you really, really see that they're really struggling. With this idea of how how can this be like it's just not possible that this is the <coughs> only ex exception to this correlation between properties and composition, there has to be some other explanation, um, and that's why this case I, I think is particularly interesting because um, we can kind of see how different types of arguments, different types of evidence weigh up against each other. So you have the decomposition evidence, but then there's the reasoning from analogy. They contradict each other, so there has to be some kind of strategy to go about making all of this work, um, and that's where the role of chemical analogy becomes even more clear, um, in in my view. So that takes me to the second part, um, where I will zoom in on some of the um, different hypotheses that they um, that Davy and Berzelius um, went through the the the, the different. Um, ideas that they explored in order to make sense um, of, of this contradiction. So um, Davy only worked on ammonium for this short period of time, so 1807 to 1813, and then he kind of abandoned the question. For Berzelius, it actually remained a super important um, substance, not really substance, but yeah, super, it remained super important in his uh, work uh, almost really until the end of his uh, life, he went through a lot of different views of what it might be, but at least he also um, abandoned ammonium as a metal um, around uh, 1813 as well. Um, they were really, really closely in contact uh, during the beginning, until about 89, and then really started to drift apart and completely have divergent views um, on, uh, on the issue. Um, but yeah, at each stage they were, both of them, um, really attached to this link between um, analogy and composition, which Berzelius himself uh, summarized this way in a letter to uh, Berthelet. 
Um, it would be very inconsistent to believe that only ammonia provides phenomena that are externally so analogous to those of the fixed alkalis, the earths and the metallic oxides, and yet internally of an entire different, entirely different nature. So just to decipher kind of this citation, the fixed alkalis are potash and soda, so, uh, which I already mentioned, um, the oxide of potassium and sodium, newly discovered by Davy. The, um, the earths are substances such as alumina, which were very similar to the um, alkalis and which were also, most of them, um, decomposed by Humphrey Davy around 1808. Um, and they were shown to be metallic oxides. So ammonia behaved very, very similarly, externally, uh, analogously, um, to all these substances that were all metallic oxides, and yet somehow it would not be a metallic oxide. That's just very inconsistent to believe that. So these substances behave similarly, therefore ammonia should also be a metallic oxide. Um, so in the next few slides, I just have um, like I summarized the different argument and logical arguments that they made, or schematized is maybe a better word. Um, so um, Paul Bartha has this um, way of um, schematizing uh, and logical arguments, which I find really helpful to just really see the um, the property that they um, inferred in this case. So um, the Horizontal relations are from the, the source to the target. There is some um, relation of, of similarity um, between P and P star. Um, and the vertical relations are then um, from the known similarities to a further feature, which is known to hold in the, in the source and therefore predicted to also hold in the target. So. Um, yeah, I hope that's clear. Um, and this is the first analogical argument that was made um, regarding ammonia, which was actually <coughs> predated uh, Davies' work on the question because that was made this made a similar one. Um, which is that, like I said, ammonia, this gas, was known to be composed of nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, therefore, it was thought that probably potash and soda, these very similar uh, substances, the three alkalis they were known as uh, together, were probably also composed of nitrogen. So this is actually how in 1806 uh, Davy said about decomposing the fixed alkalis potash and soda, thinking, well, they're very similar to ammonia, so they will probably be compounds of nitrogen as well. He wasn't the first to make this inference, but he was the first uh, to actually decompose them. Um, and what he found was that uh, they weren't compounds of nitrogen, they were compounds of these new metals, potassium and sodium, with oxygen. So what he did was um, reverse his previous um, argument and doubt the knowledge that he had of the composition of ammonia, saying that even though previous experience on ammonia left no doubt of its nature in the mind of the most enlightened chemist, all new facts must be accompanied by a train of analogies and often by suspicions with regard to the accuracy of formal conclusions. So basically, this new knowledge made him think, oh, wait a minute, then there's probably an error some, somewhere in the studies that we did of ammonia, um, and we can reverse the previous um, analogical argument, taking ammonia as the target, knowing with this new knowledge of potash and soda, thinking that probably this oxygen must also be somewhere in ammonia. So probably instead of being all compounds of nitrogen, all the alkalis are probably all compounds of oxygen, which in early 19th century chemistry would have been a super amazing success because oxygen was already uh, linked to acidity. So if it could also be linked to alkalinity, then that was just beautiful um, as a theory kind of around the importance of oxygen. Um, and this actually seemed uh, to work out at first um, because, yeah, Davy for a while thought that he was able to confirm that ammonia contained oxygen. Um, then actually through repetition, uh, it turns out that he was not. <laughs> um, but he did really keep on to this, this idea that um, ammonia um, contained oxygen. Then, um, I already referred to um, this happening a few times. In 1808, 
he was able to decompose all these other cellifiable substances that were really similar to potash and soda. So the um, the ones I already referred to, the earths and the um, alkaline earths. So all these substances that were really similar to potash and soda, um, lime, um, magnesia, barites, etc., among which was also alumina, um, and show that they were all composed of oxygen and of a metal. So now we have a whole family that has a similar composition, except for ammonia, sort of, or at least that's not clear. So. Um, he slightly adjusted the argument and now said that, okay, they all contain oxygen and a metal, so um, ammonia also has to contain um, oxygen and a metal. This metal will be called ammonium. Um, the additional evidence, of course, for this was this really amazing experiment of ammonia forming an amalgam. Um, so, this added even more um, evidence that um, all these other substances not only reacted in the same way, but also formed an amalgam. Um, ammonia also formed an amalgam, so this um, added yeah, even more likeliness to uh, the conclusion that um, ammonia would also contain a metal called ammonium. Um, however, there was still this, all this other evidence that really went in the opposite direction. So um, even the fact that there was an amalgam uh, didn't solve the fact that there were various contradictions. Um, the attempts to isolate this metal from the amalgam all failed. So no metallic ammonium could be taken from the amalgam. Um, repeated attempts to confirm the oxygen content of ammonia also failed and repeated decomposition of ammonia continued to produce only nitrogen and hydrogen. So this wasn't this, just Davy working on it, but multiple chemists um, in um, France and in the UK were, were, were working on uh, this question and just repeating, repeating the decomposition of, of ammonia and all they could find was just nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, so they ke kept running into this, running into this contradiction. So, how might that be solved? Actually, Davy's suggestion was maybe the oxygen of ammonia is not like free oxygen that we can just take out. Maybe it's contained within one of the elements that compose um, ammonia. So he said probably nitrogen itself is a metallic oxide. Um, and it just seems to be an element, um, but the, the oxygen of ammonia has to be contained um, within nitrogen. <coughs> so, in other words, he was more willing to question the elementary nature of nitrogen and hydrogen than to admit that maybe that there was just this really curious exception uh, that one substance just did not follow this rule. Um, so by 189, he was strongly inclined to suspect that there was this whole series of oxides of ammonium. So hydrogen would be the first oxide, ammonia the, the second one, and then nitrogen, a trioxide. Um, yeah, very complex reasoning also going on here, but um, yeah, this was, this was his um, suggestion here. This was really taken on by Berzelius. So he has stated a little bit at first, and then 1810 was just really running with this. Um, so here is an example from a paper from 1811 where he just has all these calculations about um, how, yeah, um, how it might be calculated, how much oxygen is in nitrogen, how much oxygen is in uh, ammonia and all these different. Um, so we had a very, very complex um, system. Um, yeah, you based on sort of patterns of composition um, between different substances where he could use those to then calculate the exact composition of substances which could not be decomposed or which could be decomposed but didn't really follow um, the, the other patterns. So it's, yeah, like I said, there were a lot of really complex rules, but the, the basic um, idea is that um, Nitrogen could only fit into these patterns of composition if it was considered to be a compound containing oxygen. So for him, that was like proof. 
Um, also that, um, yeah, nitrogen was, was uh, a, an oxide of ammonium and ammonia was then a higher oxide, um, yeah, even though it seemed to behave like an, like an element that was just sort of superficial. Um, so we also really see that Berzelius takes this idea of analogy and composition to a whole new level, um, making the composition really down to the exact proportions um, and yeah, a, a sign of analogy between um, different substances. So um, yeah, I have a whole another slide about um, Berzelius' work, but it's basically he also kept changing his mind about nitrogen, first being the oxide of um, ammonium, and then in 1813 said, no, actually, it's um, not the oxide of ammonium, it's the oxide of this other radical, sort of um, not yet an, uh, isolated element called nitric, um, changing his mind again about what ammonia <coughs> was, and then only in 1820 did he actually accept that nitrogen might be a chemical element. Um, which then again changed his view of what ammonium was and then even later in his work ammonium started to play a role in his views of organic substances. Um, so all of this, yeah, all of Mercedes's work is like very complex and even people around that time write to him saying actually your view of composition is so complex it's really hard to understand so I won't really go into it uh, much more but the, the yeah, the basic idea is that he kept sort of adjusting on this, uh, based on this rule that all the similar uh, substances should be composed um, similarly. Um, while all of this was happening, actually, Humphrey Davy was also, again, changing his mind. <laughs> um, so actually, only a few months after he had suggested to Berzelius that nitrogen was an oxide, he again completely reversed his argument and said, no, actually, I will accept that ammonium is compounds. So it seems it appears to be a compound of, um, um, so hydrogen and nitrogen as well. Um, yet it's also still metallic. So um, <coughs> he took it to be a compound metal and then used that as the basis for an ana analogous um, and logical inference to say that probably all metals are compounds. Um, so, like you said here, in late uh, 89, he suggested that the phenomena perhaps might be more easily explained on the notion of nitrogen being a basis, which became alkaline by combining with one portion of hydrogen and metallic by combining with the greater portion. So, it first forms um, ammonia, an alkaline substance, and then when ammonia combines with even more hydrogen, it becomes a metal. Um, the argument then becomes, you know, we have this one example of a metal that has been decomposed. That's evidence for all metals being compounds. So he very explicitly states this in his textbook saying, as far as our knowledge of the nature of compound bodies has extended, analogy of properties is connected with analogy of composition. So, yeah, <laughs> the kind of explicitly saying um, what, what I have been saying. Um, and then if, if one of the inf inflammable solids or metals is proved to be compounds, there would be strong evidence for supposing that the others were likewise compounded. We have one compound metal, all of them will be composed. Um, so we stuck with this actually for a relatively long uh, time, uh, until about 1812, 1813. Um, and then after that, uh, gave up on the idea altogether. Um, he just stopped publishing on it. He referred to ammonia in almost all of his papers during this time and then all of a sudden just did not refer to it anymore. In one of his letters he said that he was deceived by the analogies and that he was resolved to trust nothing but facts. So he, it seems that he was just like, okay, I give up. Like, I don't know how to make sense of this thing. No. Um, but I'm actually, yeah, uh, going to do some more research on that soon uh, to find out if something specific happened, like if, yeah, um, it's hard to know why he just stopped, but I think, yeah, he just, he just couldn't make sense of this, um, these contradictory facts. Um, 
Yes, so I just ran through like a whole um, series of um, arguments just to summarize them of what I um, said in the second part in one slide, these different arguments. Ammonia contains nitrogen, therefore potash and soda contain nitrogen, was the first argument. That turned out to be false. Instead, it was potash and soda contain oxygen, therefore the inference was ammonia contains oxygen. Ammonia forms an amalgam, therefore it has to contain a metal. If um, oxygen and the metal cannot be detected in the ammonia directly, then it has to be somewhere else, so probably nitrogen must be a metallic oxide. And then lastly, Davy's argument was ammonium is a compound of hydrogen, therefore all metals are compounds of hydrogen. So in all of these arguments, the premise is, again, uh, analogous substances are similarly composed. And even though they keep running into contradictions, they stick with this idea instead of just saying, well, it's just an exception. Um, and I find that remarkable to say, yeah, at least. Um, yeah, and you can really see that it's disturbing to them, this whole like contradiction. Um, so even though um, the importance I think that they attach individually to this kind of rule can vary. Um, so someone like Berzelius was extremely attached to it. There were other people who were who were willing, like Gabi and Tana, for example, in France, they actually did admit that ammonia was just an, an exception. Um, so there was there was variation, um, but despite all of that, I think that you know it can tell us something about the use of um, analogy in chemistry and specifically in the study of chemical composition around this time. So um, let's talk about that <laughs> in the last part. Um, so yeah, what, what can we actually maybe learn from this case? Um, so, as I see it, um, in the literature on analogical reasoning, there are kind of two main questions. Um, it's either the question of justification, is this a good analogical argument, or the question of the different functions of analogical reasoning um, in scientific practice. And um, yeah, we can talk about it more in the discussion, uh, but I will say already for now that I'm, I don't, I don't think that this case is the best uh, one to answer the first question. Um, also because, um, so it's not really a question that these chemists were asking themselves. Um, they are not really discussing about like, is this argument valid? Uh, they're not really looking for a logical justification or a valid argument. It's just a very messy situation and they're using everything that they can use. Um, and in that sense, I don't know if logical validity is really the, the most important point here. Um, but I do think that we can use this to say some, something about the different functions of analogical reasoning and scientific practice, also because it kind of brings all of the functions, or what I would like to do is bring all of the functions together. So um, analogy has been said, you know, to help with discovery, form, formulate new hypotheses, but also with justification, um, yeah, obviously justifying, establishing uh, plausibility. Um, with experimental design and um, in some cases also as complementary evidence. Um, and I think um, if we interpret it as kind of a, a guide in the process of um, laboratory reasoning, it can sort of bring together all of these um, functions. So um, what I mean by that, so that's also why um, initially my, the the title I had for this presentation was um, The Role of Analogy in the Process of Epistemic Iteration. <coughs> Thinking about it a bit more, so I still think that that could work, but I actually also want to combine it with this notion of laboratory reasoning, which comes from um, Catherine Jackson, uh, Jackson's recent book um, on organic chemistry in the 19th century. Um, so just to specify both of, both of these terms, so epistemic um, iteration comes from um, 
has a chunks book on uh, the history of temperature scales. Um, and he describes um, the, the development of these scales as an iterative process um, through which uh, the correct values were gradually established. So um, at each stage, corrections are made to the previous um, knowledge. And it, it's not necessarily the approaching of some pre-existing correct value. It's just, well, you know, these scientists are working in a context where they just have a specific knowledge that's all they have. They need to build on that to get as far as they can get and then they end up to this point where actually the things that they're finding out are contradicting their previous knowledge. So they're adjusting it and they're like going through this iterative um, process in that sense. That is um, similar I think to what's happening um, in the ammonium case where you know they there is a certain uh, type of knowledge available to um, Davian Brasavius. They build on that as best as they can. Then they realize that probably what they're finding is contradicting their previous knowledge, and they're adjusting it um, every time. So a similar process, uh, like I said, is described by um, Catherine Jackson, but less so the iterative um, aspect of it. Um, she talks about laboratory reasoning as um, the way in which experiments stabilize concepts and um, uh, yeah, basically um, leads to the development of, of new knowledge. So it's kind of about the relation between experiment and um, theory. Um, and I think in both of these cases, so the, the, the important thing is that it's, it's a gradual process and it's a lot of just correcting things as they're going on um, gradually approaching something that feels um, coherent, um, operational, um, etc. And I think that analogy can really play a role in these kinds of processes. Um, so kind of guiding, at least in this case, Davian Brazilia is guiding in which direction they could move. Um, which hypotheses might be plausible, how they might adjust um, their previous knowledge. Um, and analogy is not really something, uh, to my knowledge, that um, Chang and Jackson um, really take into account in that process. So I think in that way, it might be um, a useful example. Um, likewise, um, like I said, so there are a lot of different ideas of how analogy um, helps scientists, how it facilitates research. Um, but it seems to me like often it's just um, the arguments are analyzed as if they're just arguments and then that's it, kind of. And um, I want to say more of like, this is, this is a whole process. So everything is always functioning together with the experimental um, design, then the interpretation of the results, and then the adjustment of the... So it's, I, I want to sort of integrate um, analogical reasoning into this more process of scientific practice um, view, rather than just analyzing them as arguments in themselves. Even though that can be helpful, um, yeah, I think this might be a new way um, of looking at it based on the ammonium story, but I, I would be... Um, yeah, very uh, open to <laughs> other suggestions or interpretations or, uh, yeah, um, for you. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what kind of where I am um, now in this uh, project. There's still also a lot of um, primary source research um, that I want to do. And then ideally, um, like for the future, I would also really like to continue looking at what happens with ammonium after that, once it's abandoned as a metal, um, how it gets taken up in organic chemistry, and then um, also as an ion in um, electrochemistry, and then even all the way until the 20th and the 21st century, it just continues to be a super surprising thing. <laughs> like It just does not behave in a way that makes uh, perfect sense. Um, 
or at least like it's yeah goes against some some of the other ideas. So there are still papers of like does metallic ammonium exist or um, can we see it as a pseudo alkali uh, metal? So just leads to interesting um, questions I think, and I actually don't don't know a lot about this work yet. So but it's something that I would like to explore further. Um, yeah, here are some references to literature that I didn't really explicitly cite. Um, and thank you so much. Right in the break. Mm -hmm.
few questions and comments. Um, but other folks can. You want me to, you want me to start here? I, I yeah, can. sure. Uh, let's see. Okay, just a couple of uh, a couple of comments from uh, Gamma Restrepo, who uh, mm -hmm. says first. Uh, the iterative process of scientific discovery has a myriological background. One starts with a hole, performs an operation on it, and comes up with new holes that are now parts of the old hole. It would be nice to explore the story of metallic ammonium from that kind of a, that kind of a perspective. So that's just a comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, yeah. And a second one, and then maybe if you, if you want to riff on responding to the comments mm -hmm. while others uh, 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 questions. Uh, Related to the last uh, slide on current, also from Guillermo, related to the last slide on current chemistry on ammonia and its metallic character. Um, a classic book of inorganic chemistry in the 2000s included ammonium as an alkali metal. The book is by Jeff Rayner Akana, Descriptive Inorganic Chemistry. Okay, so yeah, to that's To this great. day. Yeah. Uh, that's very cool. Um, it's a good book. <laughs> yeah, it's a good it's good. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, I guess, uh, to do that. And it's similar. Um, there also, ammonium is not the, the, the only substance in that sense. Um, because there's also cyanogen, is that how you pronounce it in English? Uh, which is like a, a pseudo halogen. Uh, but Gary, Patterson and Gary Patterson had actually mentioned that during the talk yeah. in the comments in the chat, saying that, yeah, that's another uh, mm -hmm. uh, another case where it was and sometimes is considered to be a halogen. Yeah, yeah, exactly, uh, because it behaves very similarly. So there just are these strange, uh, yeah, kind of compound radicals that behave as if they're simple. Um, and this also has a whole uh, history in, in, so I'm more familiar with the 19th century part, but um, where, again, in the 1830s, 1840s, um, the idea that there could be compounds that behave as if they're elements, then was reason to say, well, maybe all elements are then compounds, because maybe they're just behaving as if they're elements, but they're not simple at all. Oh. Um, okay, Brigitte, uh, Brigitte adds, uh, also see the same author's book on the periodic table, which looks at many unknown analogies in the periodic system. Oh, okay. Descriptive. Uh, okay, yeah. That so the same guy, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff G-E-O-F-F, -F, British Jeff, um, yeah. Rainer, R-A-Y-N-E-R, Dash, Canon, C A N H A N. Okay. Canon, um, right? Okay. okay. Let me just note in chat. Thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah. So, get some comments? I think that's okay for now. Um, I can loop back. There's some other smaller comments if, if we have. Uh, Things that was super interesting. Um, so, just that I'm a logician, so I look at that analogical reasoning from that uh, point of view. And I was wondering um, how they came to. I mean, so, what kind of. So, this is by, partly the distinction between discovery and, and, and justification, I guess. But I would like to know uh, to what extent these guys believed the results of their analogical reasoning or were, did they treat it as, as research hypotheses of which they were quite, uh, I don't know, confident or something? But did they actually believe it? Would they say this is true because I had this analogical reasoning? By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm completely, I think really we should see analogical reasoning as part of a bigger process. I think that's a very nice uh, observation that I completely agree with. But, 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 but if you do take them apart, uh, the results that were really dependent on this analogical reasoning, would you say that these guys believed these results? In virtue of the analogical reasoning, mm -hmm. then? Um, it's hard to give one general reply to this. So uh, it depends on the individual. Someone like Berzelius was super, super convinced that analogy was always um, 
true, I guess it's not really, the, yeah, uh, a, a valid reason to even to question experimental results. So he was completely unwilling to, to admit any um, exceptions and just saying like, well, I, ca I calculated the, the composition of this substance based on analogy and so I, I know it. It's, or like even his thing of saying I placed an ammonium with the metals, assuming that everyone will see that I'm right. Uh, and he was also the last person to admit that chlorine was an element or one of the last. He was very, very attached to this kind of general rules. Um, someone like Davy is just really hard to know because s something that he said in 187 will be completely different or like his views, uh, fundamental views of nature and elements and matter, they completely change. It's just very volatile. He will say like anything and the contrary in within one article. So it's hard to know what is actually <laughs> his belief or like how uh, and that was also really hard to kind of establish this chronology of what is he even thinking because he just says a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, but um, in general, I think it just seems very, very plausible to them. Um, and that could be said for most of the 19th century for as far as I know and probably even before then also, maybe also after that, I, that I don't know. Um, but, um, yeah, I, this this rule of an, an analogy being correlated to, to composition comes back all the time. And there are, for example, a lot of discoveries that are established based on them, also in, in mineral analysis. Um, metals that were identified that were never isolated, but everyone was accepting them anyway, because it just, yeah, worked really well, really often, and that's reason enough to think that it will probably also work this time. So that's my can I do a quick understanding. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, so and nowadays chemistry, do you think there are still parts of it that where our most likely beliefs are actually just based on logical reasoning? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not really uh, deep into the current chemical literature, but I have met, or you probably know more about this than me, uh, but um, I have met people at conferences, for example, who are working on completely like current day chemical questions where they still, yeah, they still search for analogs or they do this completely analogical reasoning. I could, if I could yeah. just help, yeah. when I did the research of the paper, you mm -hmm. kindly remind that I, I wrote on analogy. <laughs> 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 It's not in the paper, but I did the, that research, and there are sociologists of science that study what, how people discuss in lab, in lab, uh, lab meeting about the next experiment, and in biochemistry at least they do analogy all the time. Most planning of new, oh we should, we know that, oh we should do that. Why? Because it looks like this. Mm -hmm. Is is like that. But they use the techniques, but this are like common knowledge and chemistry based on it. I mean, that's that 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 that's your job. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know, but analytical reasoning is used all the time. Right, but I don't, I don't doubt yeah. that. Uh, I still wanted to push it a little bit further. Then. But I don't know if yeah, I don't know if there. It's an analytical field. Cosmo mm -hmm. Cosmology of uh, relation between level is analytical. Mm -hmm. A direct, a direct follow-up comment from Guillermo who says, and, and it's also, of course, the center of all the current uh, machine learning and AI approaches to chemistry are all analogy-based yeah. right. as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a very good um, So I've, I have, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got two. I'm going to, first, I'm, uh, I have one from, from online and then I'm going to ask, what am I on? Um, but I have, uh, uh, Vicky and Gary who are kind of riffing off each other and it gets sort of simultaneous discovery in the comments. So first, uh, if you want to say, I want to comment on the fact that from the historiographical point of view, your study of ammonia demonstrates how the chemical, the chemical reasoning uh, in this at this time is still deeply pre-Lavoisier. Uh, the oxygen or hydrogen tightly contained within nitrogen is a very caloric kind of argument, isn't it? And simultaneously, Gary was typing in the chat. Lavoisier is partly responsible for this. His oxygen was a principle, not an element, and so that's kind of. Uh, uh, 
the uh, uh, Jose himself was very afraid of the Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 but she follows up and says, you know, among the perspectives you mentioned for further research on this on this fascinating topic, or, or a topic that you make fascinating, I guess, she said, uh, do you intend to also look at, 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 the, at the practice? The, wait, sorry, which practice is that? Um, uh, actually, I am not entirely positive. And how, uh, 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 no, I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely sure which practice. Practices surrounding Worst research on ammonium, perhaps? Uh, there's like a 10 second delay, so we'll take her a moment to. to okay. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but in that sense, yeah, I can already maybe comment on the pre Lavoisier thing. So, yeah, first, firstly, Lavoisier himself was very bad Lav Lavoisier. <laughs> um, and in that sense, I think a lot of the people in the early 19th century were like Lavoisier because they um, were still, yeah, also making a lot of exceptions, dealing with a lot of, like, so Lavoisier's definition is really good, really simple, and uh, gives a clear criterion, seemingly, but in practice it's just more complicated. So uh, they, yeah, they were making these distinctions, not all indecomposable substances or elements, and I think for Lavoisier that was also the case. So. I, have the, I have the second half of the question now. It hadn't come in when I first saw it. Yeah. So practice in the sense that uh, uh, how mere manipulation of substances in the laboratory might seem to rest on a very primitive kind of analogical reasoning that, that's slightly different from the philosophically pure concept of analogy. So there might be different mm -hmm. senses of analogy practical one and the theoretical one. Yes. I think it's the um, uh, Yeah, so a lot of this, um, I have been kind of wondering also to how to, how to make sense of it sometimes because I think, so all of these chemists very clearly use the term analogy and throughout the, um, most of the things that I've looked at in the, the mostly the first half of the 19th century. Um, but it's um, what they mean by it and what they mean by similarity is changing and depending on the stuff that they're able to actually do with these substances. And then on top of that, a lot of it is also tacit knowledge almost or, mm -hmm. or qualitative, like embodied. So in the mineral chemistry work, um, a lot of them will just say, oh, it's so obviously analogous to this other substance. And they don't specify, it's just anyone who's dealing with these two substances will see or will feel or will sometimes even smell that they are analogous. But it's hard to really characterize that uh, as a like clearly defined sort of account of what analogy is. It's just, it's very, yeah, it's just very obvious to the people who are dealing with the actual substances, but not so much a very explicit account of like, here is my argument. It, this and this are the explicit, like the positive similarities. Uh, therefore, I deduce that, that and that is just, yeah. Um, so a lot of it is, I think I necessarily have to do with a lot of this more practice stuff because that's just, What's like that's the only way that this that I can study these um, arguments. So I hope that yeah, that's an answer to the question. Then I have one of my own. Um, mm -hmm. So for someone who who I know a bit of the nineteenth century stuff, but but uh, you know most of my chemistry knowledge is from high school and college. Um, my gut reaction to this, and I just wonder if anybody at the same time had the same had the same reaction. So, from a contemporary perspective, you look at you look at that experiment, and you go, "Oh yeah, of course!" Like they teach us that you know. I feel like I, I was taught this in whatever eleventh grade chemistry class. Mercury is weird. Amalgamation is super strange. And so, I, was anybody did any? What was the thoughts at the time about, if you will, picking up the problem from the other end, from the mercury end, instead of from the ammonium end? Because from a, like I said, from a twenty twenty four perspective, like that would be like my gut reaction would be, yeah, mercury is really weird. Like it does really strange stuff when you mix it with things. Um, so, what was the thinking on mercury in this period? Um. So at least the arguments that I know from that side are that even if mercury is weird, it doesn't form amalgams with non-metals otherwise. Um, if you look at other examples like 
Um, Cinnabar, I think, yeah, it's not metallic or like, uh, yeah, that's like one of the examples that it comes up uh, a lot, which is a compound of mercury with a non-metal. I want to say sulfur, but I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure. But like with the other, it, like as they would say, inflammable bodies or non-metallic substances, it doesn't form um, these amalgams. Um, so in that sense, um, it had been pretty useful as a test. Yeah. And even then, also, I think at least for Davy and Berzelius, the, the argument of it's just really weird was kind of unsatisfactory. Um, because, the, yeah, like I said, so there's it's another exception. Yeah, 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 it's, another, it's just, oh, yeah. well, this substance doesn't do what we want, but then, but how, <laughs> like, that, that's just not acceptable. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. because they could have also said, well, ammonia is just, really weird and I mean it kind of is but that's not really an explanation of what's really happening um, in the sense that they were looking for I think um, because yeah you so game seconds and are the only ones that say we just have to accept that it's not doing any of the stuff that substances are usually doing it's very weird um, and that's it. But I think, I don't know, I also have some like maybe more historical arguments about why they specifically were willing to accept it in that way. Like it's, it's, it's hard to always know why people are doing things, of course, but um, they were also in a different context. Berthelet, who was the, one of the people who first analyzed ammonia and showed that it was a compound of nitrogen and hydrogen, was like more or less their direct um, superior. So. It, I don't know, to me also seems like risky to question his uh, previous analysis of mm. the substance. Um, things like that, yeah, maybe they also just had different styles or... Yeah. Um, but even from today's perspective, I, for as far as I know, this is, this is fairly exceptional that you can make this amount of sure. exceptional yeah. enough so that people are still doing it and yeah. still citing it in course textbooks and Cool. Things like that. Yeah, it is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> or at least I, I don't know. <laughs> I have to choose, but okay. So there's the. Thank you. It's a very interesting talk, and really, you found a case where you use analogy one after the other all the time. But in your talk, it was not clear to me the difference when. They are conscious to use an analogy, so the square, this is to this, this is to this, and it seems the very strong guiding principle correlation between behavior and composition. Because they could use analogy without that, without this principle, they could use this principle and develop it without analogy. So what is the, why do they believe that composition and behavior are so correlated at that time, because they don't have an atomic notion yet, they have. Why do they think that this principle, because it seems to be a guiding principle beyond analogy, why do they think it's probably true? Um. Yeah, I've wondered about this, and my sort of hypothesis is that maybe it becomes a kind of goal in itself um, in order to be able to explain chemical reactions or explain properties on the basis of composition this correlation needs to be there because otherwise there can't really be an explanation so um, that expresses itself in different ways for different people again. Uh, but for Berzelius, for example, his goal during this time um, was to really establish a system where the properties of substances can be explained based on their composition. So um, this, and then specifically uh, in relation to oxygen, which for him was a really central um, substance uh, element. So. Um, Depending on if something is uh, a protoxide or dioxide or trioxide or how much oxygen it contains, that will modify its properties. Um, and then based on the element that is combined with the oxygen, the properties are modified. So he really tried to um, 
established a system where he could correlate or at least um, have a kind of general system for um, yeah, explaining properties on the basis, of, or at least correlating them in a way, probably for teaching. But I don't want to misinterpret you, yeah. because at the beginning of the answer, you almost said something like it's almost a transcendental principle because they needed to build that new science. Mm -hmm. So if, it, if they believe it was false, they would not even begin to do that kind of practice they are doing. So they presume it's true. On the other hand, they would like to know <laughs> for real. Is it something like that? Because that yeah, that's is. much more than the as a Chang approach. It, it's mm -hmm. really a fundamental principle that if it's not true, or most mm -hmm. of the time, we would not engage in the scientific practice yeah. at all. We would do something else than try to decompose stuff. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, probably they don't have much data to be sure it's true. Which is interesting at that time. Yeah, and there's no explanation really for I, why, I or how. Because yeah. this analogy between the micro world and the macro world, probably they don't mm -hmm. believe it anymore. In the Middle Ages, they would be quite yeah. comfortable with that. Of course, there's a there's an analogical, structural analogical relation between the micro and the micro, so it must work. But it, do they share that? I suppose not. That's mm -hmm. plus the cap, plus yeah. Newton, plus the... Yeah, um, <clears throat> no, yeah, not for as far as I know, not really. Um, yeah, so there, at least I know of one <laughs> paper uh, uh, that's from a different context of so 1840s, a chemist who um, completely was working, yeah, just on mineral analysis, a theoretical stuff, let's say, just very uh, concrete questions of how is this mineral composed, what's this mineral's composition, identifying chemical formula from beginning to end. All his papers are just that. And then he has one paper where he makes one very short remark on some theoretical system of atomic weights, and he just says it has to conform to the fundamental rule of chemistry that similar bodies are composed similarly. And he doesn't comment on it at all, but that was the, the one of the papers where I really thought, oh, okay, so decades later, this is first of all still there, and then second of all seen as just a rule mm -hmm. like it that has to be the fundamental principle of chemistry. Um, but yeah, for these earlier years, it a lot of it is still so. They're still really setting things up, I think, uh, in terms of chemistry. Like how do, how does it work? Um, what are the what is the fundamental rule of chemistry really? Like it's not so clear, I think, always. Um, but yeah, it's. I have to think about this part. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really good. Point. I want to insist. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. The case you presented, it seems pretty clear in your yeah. mind that it's a powerful principle. So they seem mm -hmm. convinced. Maybe it's not absolutely true, but we use it like it was. So it must be... Follow up on exactly this point from online, actually. This is, this is like the most active chat, I think, <laughs> ever in seminar history. So bravo to both you and everyone online. Um, but so I have to scroll back up to get it all. Hang on. Um, so first, and this has all been unfolding during this discussion, so, so, so Guillermo said by saying that the interplay between experiment and analogy is nicely exemplified by the expansion of the chemical space. There are results showing that hydrogen was similar to alkali metals in the early years of the 19th century, but then with the surge of organic chemistry, it becomes more like the halogens. And, I mean, Gary, and then Gary adds, well, then of course, I mean, it, can, it plays all kinds of chemical roles at high pressures and temperatures, it's a metal. <laughs> And then, and then uh, Brigitte adds, uh, because they still live in, this is because they still live in the conception of principles as bearers of properties that these principles carry into the composition. In other words, being inflammable is explained by the presence of a principle of inflammability. Like we've disconnected simple substances from principles and bearers of properties, but that comes back in organic chemistry, in organic chemistry later on. Um, and so maybe that's a helpful mm -hmm. that gets right at gets right at these kinds of questions about where the like what what's doing the causal power in here? What's what's is it is it just what's this connection between composition and this ability to do things? Mm 
Um, yeah, and for Davy, there's definitely at least so Berzelius. I have to say, I'm not so sure how he feels about this principal idea, but maybe it does. Yeah, I, I have to say, I don't know that much about the organic context. Um, but for Davy, it's sure that that's one of the things that he's really thinking about, at least until. But again, like I said earlier, like his views really, really changed also during this period. So at first he was really looking for principles. The principle of alkalinity at first would be nitrogen, and then that turns out to be probably oxygen, which then is the principle of both um, acidity and alkalinity. Then he has this idea of hydrogen as the principle of metals, metallic nature, uh, in sort of phlogiston-like reasoning. Um, so he was really, really thinking about it that way as a causal relation between composition and properties. Um, but I don't know if it would work the same way for since he had this really complex system where oxygen, yeah, I don't know. It's, a, it's a, yeah, oh, that also is really complex. Um, but it's, that yeah, there's a definitely a lot of principle-like thinking going on. Um, in, still in the 19th century, even though they don't, yeah, they don't like to explicitly say that that's what they're doing, but the, it, it comes up, yeah. Bridget says you already showed it very clearly with Dave, so. Okay, thank <laughs> 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 Yeah, but thanks for all these uh, remarks. This is really super helpful. Um, um, oh, yeah, uh, I it's a bit of a, um, Different question, I guess. Uh, when you talk about this belief between composition and properties, uh, would you say that this is still like present today? I mean, in, in you know modern philosophers of chemistry, do they believe that there is some at least correlation between composition and properties of of substances? Right? I mean, that seems like a safe assumption. Yeah. Yeah, I okay. think composition became a lot more complicated uh, as a concept over the course uh, of the nineteenth century because now there's things like molecular structure. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So if we take take this into account, I was just thinking about uh, Putnam and the you know two and earth uh, experiments with the, the water. Mm -hmm. It's H two O and X Y Z. Yeah. And then we have philosophers that have this you know intuition apparently that. Yeah, that's completely fine, right? That we have the, these two substances with mm -hmm. completely the same superficial properties, but completely different microstructure. Yeah. And then uh, uh, I read like a philosopher of chemistry, I think it was Needham, and he said this is just insane, right? It's yeah. just <laughs> complete pure fantasy. So I was just wondering, uh, as a philosopher of chemistry, this is in this in these circles, what, what do they think about? thought experiments like that, you know, the mm -hmm. Twin Earth uh, examples. Yeah, I think most would agree that it, it doesn't really doesn't work. For at least the Twin Earth, like, yeah, um, I guess it would be interesting also to hear like the chat and your uh, view on this, but um, I mean, for me, it's it's kind of inconceivable to just imagine that there would be a substance that behaves the same as water and it doesn't have the same composition because that composition is established based on its chemical behavior that's how we know that it's composed that way so how like i just i just don't really understand how it's yeah, possible with, with ammonia <laughs> we have like you know, just some properties you know that mm -hmm. uh, obviously it shares with metals if I understand this correctly mm -hmm. and even that's like you know wait a second what's going on here right if we actually had two substances that were completely different and had all of their properties the same that would be like a insane scientific breakthrough I mean, I mean yeah but superficially every water and water behave almost the same no superficially okay. every water and water I think water very pretty close chemically. Physically there's difference mm -hmm. and blah blah but chemically mm -hmm. pretty close. Is yeah, but they're composed of the same elements. Right. I mean I guess we yeah. can yeah. Composition. Depends what you mean by composition. Yeah. 
and know them exactly the same. Because if it, I would include in behavior things like if I electrolyze it, it produces hydrogen and oxygen. Um, yeah, I mean, that's part of chemical okay. behavior. Or uh, if I, I don't know, so the drink it, then I die or I die. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the distinction is between chemical properties and physical ones. Um, that's what you mm, seems to aim at. Yes. What? Because every water is physically different than water, mm -hmm. but chemically really, really close. Yeah. So it depends what you mean by composition in the in the Putnam example. Yeah. But then again, I mean it's close, but it's not the same, is it? No, it's not the same. That's why it's, yeah. so why it's a Putnam example. Yeah. yeah. But it, it always seems that you know. You have a neutron more. You yeah. Know? The small differences always somehow translate, right, to, to the larger differences. If that wasn't the case, the scientists would be really baffled, right, if this happened, right, that you had like just some small differences on the physical or chemical level, and then no differences up there, right? It just yeah, it would be like well, the, yeah, what's happening, right? That something something's well, not mm -hmm. something's not right, right? But just based on yeah, already the fact that the knowledge of the microscopic is comes from the macroscopic just his, historically so yeah. it's i find that di yeah a difficult argument to say it no, but, yeah, microscopically it's, it's different but we don't it doesn't mean like how then how do we know it's microscopically different i don't know maybe that's a uh yeah that's how that's how i Thought kind of reading about this uh, water example. Right? Okay. Have, yeah, so I, get, I guess I agree with you probably on this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question. Uh, so you analyze all these things as analogical arguments, and, and that makes a lot of sense, obviously. Uh, but the focus on exceptions, certainly towards the end, makes me think that they could maybe also be read as, as induction arguments, mm -hmm. because all these the, the, the reasons why they become problematic is problematic is all like it, it all has to do with some kind of uniformity, mm -hmm. which is typically what justifies induction arguments. I'm, I'm not even sure whether you can make a, a real distinction between induction and and. An analogy, but I wonder whether these cases you you're open to mm -hmm. analyze them otherwise, or whether they are really like clear analogy arguments, and, and you can't read it otherwise. Um, I think they can be seen as induction arguments, but yeah, analogy is also a kind of induction, right? Or at least the distinction guess, is not always to some extent. Uh, yeah. I guess it's, it depends on author to author how. Mm -hmm. um. so we disagreed about that once, I remember. Oh, we did? I don't know. Because I was. Analogy for me is an inductive reasoning. What you call induction is the generalization. Yeah. And everything is blah, blah, blah. Therefore, I have a sample, yeah. blah, blah, which is a Kapna induction or Aristotle. For me, that's an inductive reasoning. Also, it's a special cases of a general category. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we, we disagree about that, but it's true. It's not obvious because you're, you're, I like your question. There's a uniformity principle hidden mm -hmm. in the reasoning of Davy and all these guys that yeah. that looks like a generalization. It's a strong attachment, it seems, to this idea the world, this sort of chemical world is uniform. And that's yeah. the last thing we want to give up. Uh, while I guess you can apply yeah. an analogy arguments also in a non-uniform world, um, especially if it's just a guide in, in research. If you really want to have your beliefs based on it, the world better be uniform, I guess. But if it's just like, oh, we, we want to have a model for this other situation, well, maybe we can start from this first thing that we already know very well, and analyze this, and then maybe we can carry out over the properties to this other thing, um, even if there is no like metaphysical basis to assume that they have anything in common. Just like they might have something in common, and gives us tools to to study this this stuff. Uh, um, and and so that's also I guess the origin of my first question. Like there seems to be a very big difference if you just say 
Well, let's test, I know, let, let, let just like let a, a thousand flowers bloom, or how do you say that? Uh, um, and, and, and let's use it as a sort of a, uh, like a way to, to, to give us tools to analyze new stuff and to find re new hypotheses. Or when you really say, I use this as a basis for my beliefs, um, you need much more uniformity and so on. Mm -hmm. It's not much of a question. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good point. Um, yes, I think so. A lot of it is, yeah, could be reformulated as um, substance A is part of this and this kind. This and this mm -hmm. kind has that composition. Therefore, substance A has this composition. Um, but I do think later on in the so first of all, I mean, they themselves use the word analogy a lot, which is how, why I took this as an analogy in part. But also, um, in later forms, it doesn't always pass through the kind formation. So there's when there are crystal shapes, for example, then um, there's a lot of comparison of um, these crystals have the same shape, therefore they have analogous composition. And then it's not necessarily something of passing through, the, therefore they are of the same kind. Of It's really just, well, we observe that usually crystals, like, I guess there is an explanation in terms of um, atoms, I guess, later. But even, yeah, we observe that usually crystals that have the same shapes have the same composition. And therefore, once you have a cr two crystals with the same shape, you can infer the composition um, so I don't know if, yeah hmm I guess it's not really a reply I'm just thinking out loud <laughs> um, yeah but it's a it's a good point but then again some people also argue that all uh, analogical inferences can be reformulated as induction yeah yeah, yeah. so that's yeah. the point I don't want to yeah no I, I but willing to accept it, but there mm. seems to be an inter interesting differences if it comes to scientific method, because like an all of science is based on induction, and analogy is typically seen as more suspicious or something. Mm -hmm. uh, we have these very good statistical tools for doing induction, uh, well, kind of general induction, while analogy it's it's more like um, not to finger work <laughs> with the mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Sorry for this Dutch perception. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't translate that. <laughs> Wet finger work. <laughs> People use their intuitions to do analogies while yeah. we have very good inductive tools. So that's why I like to, to, to mm -hmm. make a distinction, even if you can re yeah. analyze phenomena in many ways, of course. Yes. Yeah. One more round from online. Um, Rajit asks, can you, can you spot a difference between decomposing a mineral and a chemical compound? Because amalgamation and alloys could, could as well like, not be seen as chemical reactions. Apparently that was seen as chemical reaction at the time. But are, could there be different sorts of decomposition in the work? Um, between a mineral and a compound? And amalgamation would then fall under compounds. Um, so, yes, I do see a difference, but actually, I wouldn't place the difference at the decomposition part. It's just that. Um, more in terms of like analysis. So analysis of, or what, yeah, what's generally referred to as analysis of just compounds in general around this time, so beginning of the 19th century, was very often decomposing things and then recomposing them using things like electricity, using things like sparks to burn uh, substances, or um, all these kind of, yeah, any 
means that could be used um, to decompose. And then mineral substances specifically were um, often studied yeah, with this specific set of um, tools that yeah, that's now known as classical analysis. Um, was it used, for example, in the case of ammonia? Um, the amalgam for me would fit in the compound section, <laughs> but I don't know, maybe... Uh, could you read the question to me again? Because I'm not sure I 100% understood that. Sorry, a lot since mm -hmm. the, the second, the second bit was because amalgamation and alloys could as well not be seen as chemical reaction. Apparently, it was seen as chemical reaction at that time. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so here, I yeah, I have to say I don't know about the views of amalgamation in general, but here specifically, um, the practice was to produce an amalgam from a compound, so it is in itself already a kind of decomposition in that sense. For example, if you produce an amalgam of potash, then it's only the potassium entering sort of in the amalgam, so it requires, the reaction altogether is a decomposition of potash, after which, or during which, uh, potash then combines with the mercury. And then you can evaporate away the mercury and leave behind potassium. Um, so in that sense, it would be a chemical reaction. Uh, maybe that's why. So here, yeah, here the idea would be that from or a mixture. Yeah. Um, or a mixture of the metals, yeah. But then, but you would need to decompose potash. Also. So that's the chemical reaction part, I think. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Yeah. The question of Peter, <laughs> another question. So the analogy you showed us is A to B, what C is to D, which is the classical analogy and Usually it's related to a certain conception of uniformity of nature or relation between level and nature. But did you see in your literature analogy of like you were describing structural analogy? I have some model, some relation between stuff here, maybe it's more than two, and I project on a target. Because this analogy, this kind of analogy, to my knowledge, appear in physics later. And I would be very curious to see if chemist invented it before. So what do you mean? The structural analogy, uh, usually historian says it's uh, Lord Kelvin that invented when he made an analogy between electromagnetic phenomenon and heat phenomenon, saying it's different, but it's related the same. Therefore, you can project an equation there on this field and it will work. Which is a which is a, a to b much more complicated. What is c to d? Is there more complex analogy are they using at that time, or is it mostly a to b? What is c to d? Because it would be it would be cool that the chemist invented before the physicists <laughs> because they are really proud of that. <laughs> um, I think there isn't. No, it's all very, yeah, just A to B is C to D, yeah. There's no, yeah. I can't think but of it, any example that's more... But it's possible because it's, they believe some principle of uniformity or analogy of nature that justify this specific form of arguments, that's possible. Mm -hmm. That's why they, they, they have so much confidence in it. Yeah. Maybe. Um, Yeah, and especially this kind of, I guess, mathematical or formal analogy, that's not mm -hmm. that's happening at all. It's all just properties, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have another one, but I don't want to 
you should probably get to go at some point. <laughs> oh, uh, we're, we're <laughs> we have a whole week. <laughs> <laughs> True. So, so it's a social, since we have an historian and not a philosopher, I can ask a social history. So I know that the Napoleonic War were important at that time for the carry on Free Davies and all these guys. And mm -hmm. so it's mysterious that your debate is 1807 to 1830. Is there some influence of the war on, on the debate about ammonia? An external effect? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, not that I know of, or at least not really the one you would expect. Um, so Davy was actually really a Francophile and also in good relation with Napoleon almost yeah. himself. So um, he was invited to France, he received a prize from mm -hmm. Napoleon for his work with the battery. Um, he was also the inspiration to build a battery in Paris. Um, so yes, that it wouldn't at least be something of like the the British versus the French, but there is. I am wondering if there's not something uh, because Gay Lussac and him were just having debates all the time about everything. They they disagreed about everything, and even in the textbook of Gay Lussac and and Tenard from 1811 in so in French they have a whole table that goes on for multiple pages where they list their own views in opposition to Davy's views on every point so they're just like we think this Davy thinks that we think this Davy thinks that and then rarely but sometimes you find oh, actually here, here we agree and then and then they go on so I, there's something um, but I think they were kind of, um, as you would say today, frenemies, like happy to to debate each other all the time because there there had there had to be some kind of benefit or something. I yeah, um, at least in presenting it that obviously in a textbook that seems surprising to me. Yeah. Um, and so they also agreed on ammonia, disagreed, sorry, on, on the nature of ammonia um, and on the discovery of iodine and on, yeah, a lot of things. Um, but yeah, that's the only sort of Franco-English thing that I found, even though, yeah, Davy was also invited into their own group in Archai, like doing, discussing with them. And but that's that's For example, there. what is the debate of ammonium in the British, not Davy? Because mm -hmm. maybe the fact that Davy was considered almost a traitor to go to get that yeah. place physically crossing the channel during the war, it doesn't create inside the Royal Society something where this subject, oh, it's Davy, so it must be wrong, or we don't work on it, or... Mm -hmm. um, there I'm... Not so sure. I only know of Thompson. Thompson mo mostly agreed with Davy. Um, he was really also convinced by this amalgam. Um, and the other, yeah, the other things I I found were kind of where it's just stated that it's it's a it's a debate. <laughs> it's like some people think this and other people think that, and we don't really know. Um, I have a hard time finding kind of an expression of what the chemical community was thinking, or even in England, it's it's hard to actually know, um, for sure. Um, yeah, but one, I mean, one sort of concrete influence was that sometimes it was difficult to get correspondence um, across, actually mostly with friends, I get the feeling. Or at least Berzelius and, and Bertolet, when they were writing to each other, sometimes you see really see in the letters that uh, they tried to send things which didn't go through, and. They had difficulty getting information across. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Maybe just a quick, quick, quick question on on a bit of a bit of analogy, I guess. Uh, you mentioned at some point, but I think you only mentioned it once. Uh, relevant similarities between the right things. Mm -hmm. Did they ever discuss? You know, 
which similarities are actually relevant or not. Because you know, you could make the case that you know everything is similar to everything. So was this ever you know a part of the discussion in, in you know, the, the chemical sphere? I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yes. But strangely, not at the same in the same places. So there was generally either discussion on classification or um, discussion on the composition of a specific substance. But then they wouldn't, um, in the cases that I've studied, they wouldn't question the relevance of the similarities of the substances that they were working on. Maybe it's it's possible that I've looked at cases where that were very consensual, so things like the alkalis, the alkaline earth, earth, the earth, those are never questioned in these debates. It's it's never, like no one, for example, says, but maybe ammonium, ammonia is not an alkaline, or maybe just the similarities that we see are actually not that relevant at all. Um, but there are, in on the, at the same time, debates going on about how should chemical classification, be organized. Um, for example, one approach was to only focus on the reaction that um, an element specifically would have with oxygen, to organize families on the basis of um, is it inflammable, is it uh, acidifiable by, through oxygen, um, or is it just like non-reactive with oxygen. Just kind of just this one property was seen as extremely relevant by one camp, and then others were criticizing this approach and saying actually you're just reducing it down to this super artificial characteristic and you should take into account all the analogies between these substances, uh, like the actually relevant similarities. Um, so this was a debate, yeah, definitely in the, but mostly in, in, in rec with regards to teaching, to how to represent all of this in textbooks. Because uh, about with, with the, uh, you mentioned the oxygen uh, classification thing, uh, were they aware that, I mean, they explicitly say, okay, this is like for pragmatic purposes, or, okay. Yeah, it was it was literally called artificial classification. Okay. Um, or maybe that was also kind of a criticism point, but um, out of sort of, yeah, pragmatic purposes of like, sometimes we just don't, there's so much information to take into account that we'll just take oxygen. Oxygen was also a very important substance for a lot of um, views of uh, yeah. composition and because the, the debate is also like, I mean, similar to, to, to the debate in biology for the classification thing, right? With mm -hmm. the linear classification and then the cladistic classification now. And you also have like these competing, competing systems where it's not clear whether you know, they're all uh, equally valid or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this is, I mean, Lamarck is the same period, so this is where we're all, we're all busy fighting about what classifications are natural and what classifications yes. are artificial. Right. This yeah, is yeah. like a huge preoccupation of this whole, exactly. whole early 19th. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not surprising that it should, I'm, uh, mm. I, I'm not stunned at all that it shows up in chemistry, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, the natural, that, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah, but in a different, or at least in different, so the same people with different publications than the ones that really actually study composition. So maybe if I can, just one short question to, to add this discussion. Um, uh, the one thing that struck me during, during the talk, and, and, and I wonder um, what, what happened historically is, is, is when you presented a case, I mean, the fact that you get this amalgam is, is, is you know, I, I can see how, how strongly evidence this must have been for them to, to claim that ammonia must contain a metal. Uh, what makes the case interesting is the fact that they knew ammonia only contained nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, but what I missed was, was, was some, some quantitative reasoning because it's, it's, it's stronger than that. It's if, if you start from 100 grams of ammonia and you decompose it, you will end up with 100 grams of hydrogen and nitrogen. There simply is no room for any metal to be present in ammonia. Unless, of course, you argue that, well, no, it's, it's the nitrogen and the hydrogen themselves that are composed of a metal and, and whatever else. But that seems to be something they were willing to entertain, but that seemed to come much later into this whole debate. Whereas at first, they seemed to be perfectly willing to accept the presence of an unknown metal in ammonia, even though quantitatively there was no room. So did these quantitative reasonings 
play any role in those discussions? Were they pushed aside? I mean, yeah, I'm wondering. Yeah, um, I, yeah, that's a really good question. I can totally see. Um, uh, Yes, the, the, the importance of that. So, um, yes, but also there, it's at least at the time, was slightly easier said than done. So, um, the first reaction of Davy was when he first said, okay, there, there's probably oxygen in ammonia. The first reaction was to look at the quantitative um, stuff and to look for discrepancies. There he found that actually in his analyses one eleventh of ammonia was unaccounted for, and then he said, "Oh, then that's probably oxygen." Um, one eleventh. Okay. Yeah, um, that's where at least the oxygen would fit in. Um, the the metal then um, <coughs> relatively soon, um, when it couldn't be detected, was or isolated. So first reaction was, "Okay, we have this amalgam." Usually, from an amalgam, you can e relatively easily isolate the two metals because mercury evaporates quite easily. They tried that, didn't work. Um, it couldn't isolate it any other way, so then it must be in these other elements. Um, there was also another type of experiment where Davy was convinced that he had decomposed nitrogen for a while um, because he had made a compound from ammonia and potassium um, and then decompose the compound and the, wa the weight relations were off. Um, so there, there is a different, it's yeah, uh, a whole explanation for why that was. But um, so he was looking at these, these things, but actually really often it's difficult. So yes, it is a really important factor, but it's difficult from the weights alone to know which substances are actually simple. Because a lot of different explanations are still possible even, um, even when you have the conservation of, of weights principle. Sure, yeah. Like, but yeah, the, um, but it's only totally completely true that they were, um, they, they were looking for it quantitatively. But because yeah, you can't just add another constituent and then yeah, the, yeah. yeah doesn't work. <laughs> um, so it all had to fit together. Good, thank you. Yeah. Well, then we'll let's uh, thanks everyone once again.